Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I am very, 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 very excited because we have an amazing guest today, and his name is Jeff Luthro. He is just, a, you know, I am just outstanding. He has an amazing story to tell us about he had experienced death and he was revived and he came back. He has an amazing story to tell and he has so many things to share. So I'm going to give the the plate right to him. And Jeff is going to tell you a little about himself and tell you about his, his experience with a near-death experience that he had and what happened and what to expect. So Jeff, please take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on too, Stacey. I appreciate it. And, uh, more importantly, thanks for giving me the space to tell my story. It's it's helpful for me and and hopefully helpful for your audience. Um, a little about me. I'm a, I'm a father. I've got three boys, uh, 14, 16, 18. Um, they're, um, they're amazing. I mean, when I tell you I hit the kid lottery, like I hit the kid lottery. <laughs> it's amazing. It's so fun. Um and the way that I, you know, the way I tee this up is like, I'm a, I'm an ultra runner. So I run ultra marathons. I'm a crossfitter. I work out. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business owner. Um, and then I say, you know, that's in a former life. So I'll give you kind of the background. The first piece of the story helps build my ego. So just, <laughs> just let me go for a second. Um, so I've always been a runner. I've always been an athlete. I was, I'm a, I'm a reformed cyclist is what I tell folks to, um, so in uh, in like August of 2020, thereabouts, I was having, I would run, you know, and one of my favorite things to do is run in the summer. I like to run in the heat and I was running, I was, you know, I was getting tired, I was getting winded. Um, and so I went to a cardiologist and said, you know, I'm having these heart palpitations and, and there was some personal stuff going on in my life as well. And, and if, you know, you can ask me about that if we have time. Um, and he said, oh no, you know, you're, you're fine. And he said, wear this monitor for a week and we'll see how you do. So I wear the monitor and I come back and he said, man, look at you. You're fine. You're an athlete. You're in great shape. You're fine. Put me on the stress test, did all the stuff. And so I went on my way. Uh, so fast forward, June 5th of 2021. And I continued to exercise and run. June 5th of 2021, I had a, a race I was doing. It was an ultra. It was a 50K. And... It was my first overnight race. So it was out in the middle of a national forest, it's out in the middle of nowhere. And there are like 16 of us running this race and it's yeah. 38 miles. Um, so I ran that race and my, I showed up to that race to win. That's what I was. I was there to win. Yeah. Um, I got second place. Oh, so there you go. You know, and and I knew that I would you know, could come back next year. I knew where I would needed to pick up. I knew where I needed to train. I knew what I could do better. But the point of that is, is I am a fit guy. I'm fit. I'm healthy. Um, that was June fifth, June twelfth, twenty twenty one. I'm doing a CrossFit workout in a gym with my son. It's a partnered workout. And for those of you out there that have that have done CrossFit partnered workouts, you know how this works, right? Once you get a little bit of an edge on on your partner, you can really just bury them, you know. And so, and that makes you go faster, and it makes them work harder. So I was burying my son, and then I started getting those heart palpitations. And now I know they're called PVCs. And so, I, you know, I stopped. I was doing wall balls, and I stopped. And I was like, all right, well, this will pass. It always does. About 15 seconds goes by and it doesn't, it gets worse. And I could wow. feel like this rapid heart rate in my neck. And so it gets worse. And I was like, oh my God, I, I have to take a knee. So I took a knee. It got worse. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to take two knees. So I'm sitting on my, I'm sitting on my heels on both knees. And there's a guy beside me that was, that was there lifting. And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Hey man, are you all right? And all I could think in that moment was, I'm scared. I'm vulnerable. I don't know what's happening. Get your hand off me. Like I didn't want to be touched. You know, I was just scared. And then immediately I was like, whoa, I'm scared. I'm vulnerable. I don't know what's happening. Please just don't take your hand off me. Yeah. Um, and then it just, it kept getting worse. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to lay down. So as I started to lay down, I was going to the ground and I was losing consciousness. And the last thing I saw was my son's white tennis shoes walking over to me. Right. And then it was, you know, obviously I, I didn't keep time. 
But uh, the video shows it's about eight minutes that I was out. I had no pulse. I had no breath. Wow. Um, they shocked me with the AED. They had the defibrillator there at the gym, fortunately. And the first time they shocked me, it didn't work. So, so I gave, you know, had that audible flat line that my son heard. Um, and they continued to do CPR. And then uh, it, it monitors your heart for two minutes, looking for some kind of rhythm. It found a rhythm and then shocked me again. And, and that's when I came to, I, and I remember everything before and I remember everything after and not much in between. And I couldn't, I couldn't piece the night before together either. Um, and that, that piece of it is important. So I woke up screaming, like screaming, screaming. And I don't know if I woke up and started screaming or if the screaming woke me up. I don't know what happened, but that's one of the things when people, when I talk to people that were there about the story, that's one of the things they say. They're like, man, that was crazy. Like I have never heard that before. Wow. Um, and, you know, so I, I didn't get to hear it obviously, but I, I do remember the screaming is what I woke up to. Um, and I had this horrible taste in my mouth. Like I was hungover, like a, a terrible hangover. Yeah. And so I looked at the coach. I was like, man, I don't remember last night. So I mean, I don't drink, but I must've gotten drunk last night. And I came to the gym and did a workout and I passed out. It's like, no, that's not what happened. Um, so about that time, the ambulance is coming in or the EMTs are coming in. They put me on a stretcher and you know, it's funny, Stacey's, I was going to refuse to go to the hospital. Really? But, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm fine. I don't need to go. Let's finish the workout. Like I'm totally oh fine. Um, <laughs> so everybody convinced me to go and, uh, and I was still having a hard time putting everything together. Like I was still, uh, I was coherent, but I was like, pieces I couldn't put together um so I went to the hospitals there for about three days no one could figure out what happened they the doctors the doctors thought I was using drugs actually because the rapid heart rate yeah um, they were asking me like about pre-workout stuff what I did I was like I, you know nothing the only thing I can imagine is that that race I did the week before put a strain on my heart right um so three days in the hospital, they came in and they said, all right, well, we know what's wrong with you. It's like, great. What is it? Well, you have uh, ARVC. It's arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So arrhythmogenic, it's a rhythm issue and it's genetic. And yeah. the right ventricle is what was swollen. And the, the wall of the heart is what the, the issue was. So it's an electrical short. Um, I said, okay, you know what? What does that mean? Well, it means you're going to have to get a defibrillator installed and we can have that done in the next uh, next 24 hours and all this stuff. And then they just laughed. So I start looking it up and it's it's a genetic mutation. And what happens is like when normal people exercise, the muscle fibers in the heart, they tear and they and they grow back yeah. stronger. Right. The muscle fibers in my heart, they tear and it's infiltrated with fat and scar tissue. So it, oh, wow. Yeah, it creates a so that's the the bad electrical signal. Yeah. Um, so the doctors came back in that afternoon and I was like, well, I can't exercise. Like this says I can't exercise. What is tell me? What does this mean? What is all this? Says, oh yeah. yeah. You can still exercise, no problem. It's just gonna be either yoga or golf. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I you know, I don't think you guys understand. You need to leave the room and come back with a different diagnosis. Yeah. It's not going to work for me. Yeah. Um, so my world kind of tilted off of its axis at that point. You know, it's, it, I, I took the position and I took the belief that everything had just been taken from me. Yeah. That's, you know, I was getting into getting my son into CrossFit. I was working out with him. I was at the peak probably of my, of my running career at, at that point. Yeah. Um, I had left running for a while and I'd come back and I was, everything was kind of falling into place as far as my physical fitness. Um, and they were telling me I couldn't do any of it. So when I, when I tell people that story, the first thing people say is, oh my gosh, you know, you must be so grateful, you know, and you would think Stacy, that I would wake up every morning and, and hit the floor on my knees, praying and thanking some entity about being alive. And yeah. what was, 
I, I couldn't find gratitude. Yeah. It was lost in the bitterness and the anger and the sadness and, and calling myself a victim. And so that made me feel worse. Right. All I could think is, wow, I must be a real piece of shit if I can't be grateful for what just happened. Right. And it just, and sorry, excuse my language. Sorry. But that just, it just snowballed. So, yeah. so the more I couldn't find gratitude, the more I beat myself up, the more I right. beat myself up, the more depressed I got. Um, and I just, I really, I really, I just wanted to burn it all down. Yeah. So, so I had my operation, they put the the device in. So I have a, a defibrillator installed. It's on me all the time. That's everything that I post. My hashtag is always never alone because I am never alone. Like the doctors always see my heart data, everything. <laughs> um, so they, I couldn't lift anything for 30 days. Like, a, you know, not even a gallon of milk, not my dog, not anything. Yeah. Um, so when my 30 days was up, I did what any smart male athlete would do. I went back to the gym. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I went with my son in the first day back is, uh, it's a barbell lifting complex. It's the bear complex where it's like oh, a, wow. a deadlift, uh, a clean, a squat, clean, a hang clean, whatever it is. And then you, you go overhead. So it's like five barbell movements all in one motion. Yeah. And the idea is get the heavier weight. But when I was doing it, I, it happened again. So that's when like it, it, my son was right behind me and and to tell you that it, he was traumatized is like an understatement you can imagine he saw mm -hmm. me die you know that I was I mean he explains it to me I, my whole body was gray people were screaming I mean it was traumatic but when it happened this day it happened for about 30 seconds my heart it goes into what's called atrial fibrillation where the the um arteries just quiver they don't pump blood yeah um so it happened again. It lasted about 30 seconds and I almost lost consciousness and I didn't. And I, I ended up propping myself up, but I, I, you know, I couldn't let him see that happen. So my body came out of it without getting shocked. And that's when I had that same taste in my mouth. Oh, wow. Yeah. That taste comes from not to, you know, this is just fact, right? The taste comes from when your heart stops pumping blood, all the blood runs out of your head first. So when the blood goes back into your head, you can taste the blood in your mouth. Oh, wow. So that is, so now I can tell you what death tastes like. I, I wish I couldn't, but I can. Yeah. But in that instant, death became so real to me. You know, people say life is short. I'm like, well, you know, I don't know about that because I can tell you life got really, really long for me for a little while, really long. Um, but I do know that death is real. And that's when I was terrified. I was scared. I was scared to take a shower because I had to close the bathroom door to take a shower. And right. I thought I was going to die. I was scared to walk up steps. Yeah. I was scared to walk on the beach. Right. It was, it was paralyzing. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I had to keep moving, right. My kids were watching me and that's, that's one thing in, in adversity, people are watching. Yeah. And we forget that even if we think they aren't, people are watching and your life can be an example or it can be a warning. Yeah. Um, so I chose to just keep moving. And I will tell you, and, and, and any of your listeners, hear me when I say this. If you take a step, I promise you the ground will find you. Just take a step. The ground will find you. Um, so I, I went to the beach one day for a walk. I used to go to the beach and run with my dog. Like I would go run. I'd run intervals and he would swim and it was amazing. Yeah. And so I went to the beach one day just for a walk with my dog and I'm walking along. And uh, this was probably August, September around in that area. So about uh, three months removed from the initial episode and then a month or a month and a half after that second episode where things turned. Yeah. And I, I was walking along. I was just thinking, you know, it, it's so funny to me that some people have a shellfish allergy and some people don't. You know, I'm just kind of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Bodies are different, right? Everybody responds right. differently. 
And then I thought, you know, maybe, maybe my body is going to respond differently to this disease. And I thought, you know what? I believe that my body will respond differently to this disease. And I remember, so then I started walking with intention. I wanted to get back, I wanted to get back to my truck, load my dog up and, and get back home. So I started walking with intention. I'm thinking this through my mind. So my plan, I did what any smart male athlete would do. <laughs> oh, God. I went back to the gym. Um, but here's what I did different. I started to research the disease. I started to research mm -hmm. the, the prognosis, the, the science, the physiology, what happens and why. And I tried to figure out what exercises I could do. So I got with a coach there, yeah. there at the gym and I asked him if he would be willing to work with me. I said, you know, I, I can't be in here with people because all of the, um, neurotransmitters are bad for me. The catecholamines that anything, um, you know, the endorphins and all the stuff that you get from exercise, that's bad for my heart. So as right. they go through my heart, that is, is part of the process. It exacerbates the, pro the problem. So I said, yeah, I'm going to have to be in here by myself. I don't want to work out alone for obvious reasons. And I need someone with me. Would you be willing to do it? He said, yeah, absolutely. So he agreed to do it. We started writing some workouts and I showed up to the gym and I was going to work out. So I get to the gym, I do my, do my first workout or do, or start my first workout. I'm warming up. And the first thing he has me do is we're just doing uh 10 kettlebell swings, lightweight. So I would do 10, drop the weight, 10, drop the weight. I do five or six, I think. And I drop the weight and I said, uh, I, and I, and at this point I'm bawling, crying, like, <clears throat> not not crying like I am bawling uncontrollably like a kid and a, a child and I said I, I quit I can't do it I I stopped he said yep I get it no problem no sweat we'll be done I just need you to give me 30 seconds of work and then and we'll quit because I want to end on a good note you can do 30 seconds it's like I don't think you understand I quit and at that point Stacy at that point I I looked at myself as a quitter I became a quitter mm -hmm. I was done I quit yeah and I said I don't think you understand and there was a lot of cuss words in there directed at him yeah <laughs> so I don't, I don't think you understand I quit I'm done I'm not going to do this he said yeah I get it that's fine just give me 30 seconds I have all day I have a client at four o'clock but I can wait just 30 seconds you can break it up however you want so I was at that point you know I was mad I was like all right I'll give you 30 seconds so i I gave him 30 seconds of work. I did kettlebell swings for 30 seconds. And I set the kettlebell down. He said, all right, dude, we're done. Great job. And I stood there for a minute. I said, you know, I, I, can, I can do another 30 seconds. And I'm still crying. Um, so I did another 30 seconds. He said, all right, man, you can be done. So now I'll do another 30 seconds. So I did another 30 seconds. He said, okay, what do you want to do? You can do this. What do you want to do? I said, well, I'll, I'll do another 30 seconds. He said, all right, we're going to go 30 seconds on and 30 seconds off. Easy pace. Let's just finish. And I did it. I finished. I took 30 seconds. I carved it out my new place in the world. And I finished my workout 30 seconds at a time. <laughs> and it was amazing. And the belief that I couldn't do it almost killed me right there in that one instance, because I can tell you how things may have ended for me would not have been fantastic. Right. I think, you know, one of the biggest things is that we have to take something positive from every negative thing that happens to us, because, you know, if, you know, sometimes like you think about these, 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 these traumas that happen to us as people, you know, we could pull something out. Well, it made me stronger. It made me more, you know, it made me look at life from a different aspect because if we look at it and we focus on that negative and we don't move out of that negative, it will kill us emotionally. It will kill us. And then when once our, our mind goes, the body goes too. it's like, mm -hmm. we're all connected. So, you know, the, the fact that your your trainer made you, well, he didn't make you, he he kind of kind of grudged you, you know, <laughs> kept pushing you until you did it. But it showed you that you're not a quitter and that you can do it. 
you know, but at your own pace, which I thought was brilliant. Yeah. 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 And, and you're right. It's, if, if you can take and change your paradigm, why has this happened for me? Where is my lesson? What do I need to learn? As opposed to why did this happen to me? Yeah. And that's, that changes the whole game. That's such a game changer. Yeah. Um, it's finding that lesson because, because if you're enduring that, if you endure that hardship and don't pull a lesson out of it, it's such a waste. Yeah. It's such a waste. You've survived everything up to here. You've survived everything. Right. Up to here. You're going to survive this too. Find the lesson. Right. Okay. I think too, like, you know, we have to, we, we lack gratitude when things happen to us, we get, sometimes we get so upset and we get so angry and we focus on the negative and, and we forget that sometimes the little things in life matter, you know, we don't realize until it's taken away from us. Like we don't realize how, how valuable our life and all the little things that contain in our life are worth until little things start you know get taken away and for you one big thing what was the fact that you you your life was taken away from you you know and then you came back and then you know and then makes you think about all the things you could have lost but you know god or the your higher source or whoever you believe in gave you another chance and made you you know and maybe that was to make you see life from a different perspective you know because i i kind of believe that everything in life happens for a reason. We might not understand at first what that reason is, but I, I feel personally deep down in my heart, I feel everything in life happens for a reason. I, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I will tell you this to not to get off in the weeds. One thing that I learned in all of this, and I'm being very vulnerable here, like this, is, I'm being totally open, is when we fall, our ego falls faster and further than we do. Yeah. And you have to choose. Are you going to let your ego pull you down and, and drag you down with it? Or are we going to do what we're supposed to do and move forward and find the lesson? Yeah. And part of, part of my bitterness and anger and part of me that when I say, when I got my first diagnosis, I wanted to go burn it down. I was going to put my running shoes on and I was yeah. going to run until I stopped. Yeah. That was my plan. Um, and that was ego driven. You know, yeah. I'll never, I'll, I'll probably never run an ultra again. I don't think I can't run as fast as I used to. It's hard to keep my body under load yeah. for that long period of time. Um, but man, if I can't find gratitude now and just being able to go out and run, yeah, I'm really missing something. Right. And that was hard. It was so, that was so hard. Oh yeah. I can only imagine. And I like how you say that, you know, it, it's kind of ego driven, you know, like the, I think yeah. one of the first things that happen to people when they go through a traumatic experience is that they're in denial because you it's very hard to accept, you know, because we, we know ourselves as what we were and then all of a sudden something happens we're no longer that person but we still want to be that person so then it's you know we get into that denial and that, and that ego is with us you know because we like that person much better you know you like that guy that was able to run those marathons and run with speed and and was vibrant and you know vigorous and you know now all of a sudden they're putting limitations on you which people hate nobody you know i don't i haven't met one person that likes limitations put on them on themselves you know usually you tell someone you should have to do this and someone's going to go out and do the opposite because no you're not going to tell me what to do you know, and, you know, I like how you, you realize you came to terms with it and you put that ego aside and you really learned how to re really accept yourself and, and learn how to love who you are today. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I, and I can tell you, there are so many days where it's like, do you hear that banging? Oh, that's just my ego locked down in the basement. Trying to get out. <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta lock them down in the basement and and push forward yeah and it wants to drag you down and keep you with it it's 
it's hard. It's tough. And then I will also say that I used excuses that were ego driven. Yeah. Oh no, I can't do that. I'll tell you something that happened. Uh, this was, you know, probably a year after the incident, I started kind of working out a little bit with my son. Doing a CrossFit workout is really tough for me now. It's it's really hard. I'm trying to get back into it. As a matter of fact, um, look, for anybody that's, that's listening to this, please don't take the message that I encourage you to be reckless with your health. That is not what I mean at all. Carve your place out in the world. Um, but I si I have signed up for a CrossFit competition in August with my oldest son. And it is able to be the last time I ever do it. That's, you know, um, and I, I did at one point make a conscious choice. You either die living or live dying. Right. Yeah. And I think I would rather, I, I'd rather die living, um, personally. Right. So when I, when I started getting back into CrossFit and doing these workouts, uh, I was writing a workout, me and my son, and uh, there was a, a barbell movement on there, thrusters. It's a it's a real, it's a heavy lift. It's a high heart rate. It's just a real taxing movement. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to sub these because I can't do these. He said, what do you mean you can't do these? I said, well, dude, I can't do this stuff anymore. And I just can't do it. He said, yes, you can. You're just scared. And he didn't mean it negatively. You know, he yeah. didn't mean it like i'm i'm a scaredy cat he meant it encouraging yeah you can you can do it you're just scared yeah you can do you can finish this workout just 30 seconds at a time right so that hit me you know okay maybe i can do it maybe i am scared and really what it was is i didn't want to show him that i couldn't keep up with him that right. was my ego that was your ego and, and i used it as an excuse and you know, Stacy, you can probably identify with this too. A lot of it, I had to ask myself the tough questions. Are you going to let your ego prevent you from doing this workout with your son? Or are you going to hide behind this diagnosis that you got and, and not let him see that you can't keep up with him? Right. That's a hard question. That is a hard question, yeah. you know, because like, you want to be just like everybody else, the quote unquote normal. And there isn't really no normal. But it's it's really we 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 perceive we perceive what normal is as a society, but it's really what you perceive as your own normal. But it is hard when you want to be able to do just what everybody else does. Like you want to be able to exercise or run and you want to be able to be able to lift a certain amount of weight. And, you know, you have this condition that says, well, you really shouldn't be doing that, you know? And yeah. it's like, but there's a part of you that says, screw this condition. I, I want to do what I, 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 you know, what I, I would, I, that really makes me drive that drive, you know? And it's, it's a hard choice to make, you know, and it's kind of like, you have to find that happy medium, I feel, which is really hard to do, you know, and then some, you always find yourself, I always see myself trying to push myself to the limit, you know, like, you know, cause I have that, you know, there, there's a, you know, I, I know what my limitations are, but sometimes you, you, in life, you just want to enjoy your life. You want to be able to do the things that you love doing. And it, and it, and it's hard to find that happy medium. It really is. Now for your self-esteem, like that must have been a killer to your self-esteem. Like, how did you get back on track? Because now you're at a point where you are, you could see you're a confident man, you're happy, you know, but when this all happened and the, all these limitations and people were telling you, you can't do this and you can't do that. How did, how did your self-esteem, your confidence in who you are, how did that hit you? Oh, it blew me apart. Um, my, I, I mean, this, this sounds worse hitting your ears than it does coming out of my mouth, but my identity was wrapped up in exercise, mm -hmm. performance, my business, not sleeping, overachieving. And I was the guy that was over 40 that could run a sub six mile Wow! and deadlift twice his body weight. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what it, that's what my identity was wrapped up in. Do you know who cares about that? No one, yeah. <laughs> no one, mm -hmm. nobody cares. Nobody cares. 
but it was important to me. Right. Because I thought it was important to others in how I was perceived. Yes. That was hard to get over. And I will tell you, um, I had a real hard time after, after it happened the second time, I had a real hard time watching people work out. It was like, it was traumatic. Yeah. Like I was scared that other, I was scared people were going to die when I would watch, like I'd watch a football game. I was scared people were going to die. My oldest son was a wrestler. So when I would go to wrestling meets, I was scared that I was going to have, uh, endorphins and I was going to have a heart attack or I have, right. have cardiac, what was, it's called sudden cardiac arrest. Yeah. Um, so any time that there was any type of adrenaline, it terrified me. Yeah. Um, I had to get over all of that. So I went to, my son had a, a competition. This was in, I think, let's see, that would have been in May, the following year, he had a CrossFit competition and I went and I was terrified. I was walking around. It was, it was, it's a two day event. So he's a competitor. I'm, I have to stay with him. I'm like his trainer, right? Pseudo trainer. Don't, don't, <laughs> um, you know, helping him, helping him get his weight set and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I was terrified. And then I survived the first day. And then the second day I was a little more comfortable but one of the things I learned, it was so deflating to be there to watch all these people competing. Yeah. And for me to sit on the sidelines with this defibrillator stuck in my side on the bench. Right. And that was nobody there knew that I had it except my son, you know, and some, some people from our local gym, nobody yeah. knew everybody was kind to me. I look like an athlete, you know, I still had the, the physical appearance. So yeah, it was just in my head. So I had to come to terms and said, you know, it was, I, I, I had a post It's probably one of my most popular posts on my Instagram account that, Hey, I, I had this weekend of competition. It was great. It was, it was great watching these athletes, watching them compete, watching yeah. them congratulate each other, watching them find their new boundaries and watching people show up just to cheer people on. And now I have found my new place in the world. And I feel like it's on the sidelines because mm -hmm. that's how I felt. And I had a really good friend of mine who I met through this, this whole uh, process said, if that's where you want to carve your place out and sit on the sidelines, then too bad for you. It's like, Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess you're right. But that's when I realized, you know, it's up to me. If I want to go be a sad sack because I can't do these things, then that's my own problem. It, I have to change my belief. Yeah. Because nobody else cares and everybody else, everybody is willing to cheer me on. Right. No one is willing to cheer me on if I want to sit on the sidelines. Right. They have games to play. Yeah. I, I like that, you know, you made a conscious effort to, to do what you want to do. You know, you looked inside yourself and you, you, you made the initiative to say, this is who I am. This is what makes me happy. This is what I want to do. And I'm going to do it. Yeah. And you didn't let anything stop you. And the, and, and the greatest thing is, is that you didn't let fear stop you. Cause I know even for myself, you know, my seizures are controlled now, but there was a point in my life where they weren't controlled. And there was a point where I was so afraid, afraid to go out, afraid to do this, afraid to do that, you know, because I never knew when it was going to come, you know, I'd get a warning signal and then it would happen, you know? So it was like that fear factor when you have any kind of condition and you don't know what's going to happen next, you know, you know, people who have heart problems, people who have problems like yours, you, you never know what the next day is going to bring. You never know when the next thing is going to happen. And that could, that, that makes people stuck in life. You know, you, you, you let fear overcome your life and your life is over because, you know, and, but the question is, is so many people, if you, if you even go on the internet and you talk about fear, you'll see how many people in life are stuck because their fear makes them not want to move forward. And, you know, what was one of the main things that helped you break through that fear? Because that, that is a very 
very overwhelming feeling to know if your endorphins are, you know, if they go high and they start producing and you, you starting to get really, you know, your body's starting to, to produce them and you're, you're starting to get really riled up that boom, you can go right into cardiac arrest, you know, and then where are you going to, you know, what's going to happen next? So yeah. the fear of even just wanting to do anything, you know, it's like that, that's, that's hard. Yeah. How did you break through that fear? So I haven't keep me on task because there's two things I want to address there. Yeah. So with the adrenaline and the endorphins, that was part of my game mm -hmm. that I gamified that. Okay. And that was one of the funnest things I would do. So like if I would get on a rower, I would turn the, the display of the rower where I couldn't see it. Yeah. In my mind, like there was one day I went to the gym to do a workout and two guys that I was always competitive with, uh, it was a guy and a girl that I was always competitive with. They put their rower right beside mine. I was like, nope, this ain't happening. <laughs> I picked my rower up. I turned it around backwards. And I rolled it to the back of the gym and I faced the wall. So I gamified it where, you know, because that's part of that's part of the workout, part of pushing your boundaries where yeah. you 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 did you find that really dark place right for the last yeah. two minutes and that's your your adrenaline so I had to get rid of all that I can't I can't use that tool or that weapon in a workout right and that's been part of the fun yeah um, like I mean there are days where I'm in the gym working out and I'm listening to like thievery corporation or right yeah you know, you know it's which is which is it's fun um but how I, so the question, how I push past that fear, I'm going to give you a really deep answer. And if you can envision someone asking you, someone that you love deeply, that you care about, that you always want to see do well, they ask you, why didn't you do this? And your answer being, because I was scared that is what changed it for me. Yeah. That's not enough. My kids were watching, my friends were watching, and to say that I didn't do something because I was scared was not a good enough answer for me. Right. Some people that may that may be a good enough answer. Hey, fear, fear is a, a heck of a motivator, right? Yeah. Um, but that was not a good enough answer for me. I like that. You know, I think, you know. That's an answer for most people. They get scared and they stop, you know, mm -hmm. but then you, you never know what's on the other side. You know, when you push through that fear, great things can happen. You know, lots of times great things will happen, you know, and I say, never say can't say can never say should say would, you know, and, 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 you know, you just like, look at the mentality, you know, and I think that's great that you were over, you overcame your fear and you weren't going to say, I'm scared. No, no, no. You, you went for whatever goal you had in your head, whatever dream you had, you made, you wanted to make it a reality and you did. Yeah. Um, and I mean, to let, to let you into my world a little bit, don't get me wrong. There have been times where I have been so terrified and there have been times, there have been times where I have felt it. I'm like, oh my gosh, why is my, why is my defibrillator not shocking me? I'm about to die right now. What's happening? And then, you know, I go download my results and the doctors say, I'm looking at your results. It's fine. But why is your heart rate so high? I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> it just was. Um, but it's, I mean, I'm going to be scared. I think I, and people ask me, I'm like, how often do you even think about that now? Like, I think about it at least every 30 seconds, at yeah. least every 30 seconds. And I think I'll always have that. So it's always going to be there. But how do I want to live? Right. I think is really what I've come to. Right. So. I think it's really important to to be able to be happy and to and to to leave a legacy where you're going to be proud of, you know, and, and that's how I look at it for myself is that when I leave, you know, wh who are people going to remember me as, you know, and not that it matters, but I want to make sure that I put a footprint in this planet before I leave this planet. Yeah. And to speak about putting a footprint, 
in this planet and leaving. I want to know, because like so many times you hear story after story after story of people who have had similar situations where they were pronounced dead and then they came back to life. And they, a lot of times you hear these stories like, oh, it's such a wonderful feeling. I didn't want to come back. I saw, you know, some people claim they saw images, uh, you know, some people say they saw people who they know and who've passed, you know, and some people say that it's just a glorified feeling, a lightness that they can't even explain with words. Did you get any of those type of things when those eight minutes were in between? Because you went through a lot. Eight minutes is a long ass time. It's, you know, it's not like 30 seconds or, you know, it. eight minutes is huge. Most people will not survive eight minutes. That's like, that's an amazing, that's a miracle in my eyes. Yeah. And you had no brain damage because lack of oxygen to the brain could cause brain damage, you yeah. know? And so yeah. you had none of that. You came no. back and, you know, you felt fine afterwards. You know, you went through your, your period, but you like recuperated one, two, three, you're ready to go back to the gym. You know, I was, I was wondering why we weren't going to finish the workout. <laughs> you know, I sat up. One, the first thing I did is they, they covered me with ice. There was an ice machine there. So I sat up and I was soaking wet. I was like, why am I wet? And are we going to finish this workout? Yeah. Well, the first thing I said, um, and you know, I have had fun with that question. Um, I've come up with a lot of answers. I, for a while there, I would tell people that I wouldn't tell them because they would want to accelerate their death. <laughs> I'm going to tell you because you'll want it so bad. Um, but there, there was nothing. It was the lights went out and the lights went on. And I do, I don't, I remember every detail down to blackness in the in the conscious world but i don't remember anything at all in the subconscious world i do have a little bit of black where i'm screaming but i think that's just me screaming before i open my eyes and that's it and that's like just a flash of of darkness before i open my eyes and i don't remember anything at all and i've i've had people tell me that i did it wrong <laughs> did it, did it seem like did it seem like did it seem like eight minutes like or did it seem so quick to you or it was like no it seemed like a flash like a blink i mean like a real flash i i don't know how to articulate that where you can feel it but it seemed like a true flash like it's like like you go in for surgery, right? And they put you out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you were in it like everything is so real before they put you out. It's so real and you can touch everything. Yeah. It's like almost almost like everything's amplified. Right. And then you wake up. Yeah. That's exactly how it was cuz I remember everything to the finest detail before I went unconscious. Wow. Like I will never forget my son's shoes. It was a white pair of Metcon fives. It was, they were custom pair of shoes. I can see them like it was yesterday. Um, and I remember, I remember the feeling so vivid of that guy putting his hand on my shoulder next to me. And I remember the transition where I went from get your hand off me to please don't take your hand off me. <laughs> So vivid, everything. I remember looking at the coach's face as soon as I opened my eyes. He was standing over me. I remember all of it so vividly, but nothing in between. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I always, that always fascinated me because you've heard so many different stories from people. And yeah. it's like, you know, it's like, wow, you know, it, it, you, you always, you know, you, you keep wondering because we, we don't know what happens after the fact, you know, and, and, you know, the fear of death is, you know, so many people have the fear of death and yeah. then you hear stories from people and they say, it's a wonderful feeling. It's like, well, maybe when that time comes, you know, there's something waiting on the other side and maybe, you know, maybe it's not so bad after all, you know, maybe there's something really good. You know, I always say, I feel like, I feel like earth is like a boot camp. We're here to learn and they're running us through the mill, you know, yeah. and, and I, I feel like after we leave, there's something better, whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know what's set for us, 
but I feel like there, there's something on the other side, you know, waiting for us, but I don't know what that thing is, you know, um, but I always feel like earth is like a boot camp, you know, we're, this is a learned experience. We're going through the Marines, the army, the air force all at once, you know, it's like, you know, but, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's always fascinated me when I hear people talk about moments of experiences where they, you know, their heart actually stopped because that's like, that's traumatic. And I still can't believe that you got no brain damage or anything, you know, yeah. lack of oxygen. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what happened to me was they're like, they have uh, these AEDs, they have a printout when, mm -hmm. so the EMT will get the printout from the AED when they, when they pick yeah. up. And there were some uh, spikes and there were my heart rate was like 396 beats a minute. <gasps> wow. So I think what would happen is my uh, heart would quiver and I think it would move blood. And they were still, they gave me CPR the entire time. There were people, I mean, the people there, and I, I can't even explain how lucky I was. They were amazing, but they, yeah. they started CPR pretty quick, about two minutes into it, I think. Um but they gave me CPR throughout the entire process and they would stop when they shocked me and then they would pick it up as soon as the shock didn't work. Um, so that continued to move blood through my body. And I think my heart would quiver and that was getting oxygen. Um, and just, just lucky, just completely lucky. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So if you had to take everything we talked about today and you wanted to emphasize on a couple of takeaways, what would you want to tell the audience? You know, things that you really think are important that you'd like to emphasize. Oh, there's several things. One is, um, you know, we all talk about it abstract, about death. But death is real. Like death is real. Right. Um, take that step. The thing you've been wanting to do or the thing you've been putting off, take that step. Yeah. And that would be one. Another thing would be, seriously, man, lock your ego in the basement. Yeah. It really keeps us from doing so much. Oh, yeah. And mine, mine wasn't even like my ego. You know, like some people don't want to wear that pretty shirt that that they have because oh you know people are going to think it's ugly if i wear it out in public i mean that's ego driven right yeah oh, definitely. um yeah some people don't want to go up and, and talk to the cute girl or the cute boy in the grocery store yeah. for fear of rejection that's ego driven mine was a refusal to exercise because i couldn't be where i used to be yeah how ridiculous is that right and I'm and I and I manipulated it and I turned it into so many different things, but all it was, Stacy, was ego. Lock your ego in the basement and yeah. just take the step. Oh, I think that's so important. That those are great takeaways, you know. And I think so many people have an ego, but once you you drop that ego, even for myself, once I let go of that ego, and I was just so humble. I learned how to have gratitude. I looked at life positively. I let go of my ego, and I just was humble. And wow, what a change it makes in your life. You know, the way you look at people, the way you talk to people, the way you look at life, the way you react to things, and it, it it's it kind of, it, it's, it's a feeling inside that kind of like you get more grounded with life and you, you really connect more with the world around you, people, animals, everything. You, you just start to connect with life itself and you learn that appreciation of, uh, and it does, it changes you once you let go of that ego, because so many people have that ego and they hold on to it. But it doesn't, it actually harms you, I think. It holds you back when we have that. When we hold on to our egos until we let go, I think it holds you back from really appreciating what life's all about. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I'll add too, like it's interesting you say about gratitude, like you realizing or recognizing gratitude. I was hung up in gratitude having to be this big magical thing. Yeah. Where... I started to learn that I can be grateful about the dinner that I had last night. Right. Yeah. And then I started to, then, then to your point, then it's what, what we could call or, or qualify as small things. You know, there's no real small thing. 
Yeah. It's all a thing. It's all something to be grateful for. And right. finding that was huge for me because I was looking for this big earth shattering, show stopping gratitude moment. Yeah. Uh -huh. It took me down to a, a place I did not want to be. Yeah. And those little things like, like this, I, I mean, I don't even, I don't even know you, but I'm so grateful that I got to meet you. This has Same been, here. this has been so fun. That's yeah. gratitude. Like, I am so grateful. I'm so lucky. Um, All of these, these things that aren't these huge earth shattering moments, they're what make up our life. Yes. Yes, for sure. And I, you know, like it, it, the, the littlest things in life, like I was saying earlier, like, I, I was looking for those big things also in the beginning. And, you know, and I think that's what really, that's what really like held me back and it actually hurt me because I was looking for the, the big diamond instead of just being, being, you know, appreciative for the little things I had and maybe the little gems or the little, little shiny rocks on the floor, instead of being, you know, having gratitude for just the simple things, I was looking for that big diamond. And then when I didn't have that big diamond, I, I, you know, I was being so rough and so hard on myself, but then, you know, it was when it was a point in my life when the littlest things that, that would not, people wouldn't even think about, you know, you know, got taken away from me. I realized how such the, the little things in life are, can meet, are, are, you know, there, we don't realize how important things are until they're taken away from us. And then once they're taken away from us in life, then we realize how valuable they are. And then we start to think about all the other little things and really, you know, we should really have gratitude. Even when we go outside, I say, I tell people, go outside and go on your porch, have a cup of coffee or tea or whatever you drink, and just take a deep breath and, and be happy for the trees you see and the air you breathe and the grass that you see, you know, because we overlook that. We we overlook all the great, great things in life, you know, and we, we're always looking for that big rock when, you know what? There's so many beautiful things around us that make us happy and we should appreciate them because like you said, your life went like this, you know, and it can't, you got, you got really lucky. You had a miracle, but yeah. it's, it's not like that for everybody, you know? And so while we're here, we really need to really be gracious and really look at the positive things in life. I say there's two main things in life that get us through everything is positivity and gratitude. You have those two things in life you will go far and you will succeed and you will be a happy person. And I think that's what people really have to remember in life. Yeah. Um, and a small challenge to the audience about, yeah. about gratitude. This is something that I do with, with my boys. It's like, okay, what's something you can be happy about? You know, when they're particularly in a bad mood or they're kind of in it, what we call in it. All right. Yeah. You're, you're in it, aren't you? Um, all right. What are you happy about? Well, nothing. <laughs> Okay. All right, dude. I get it. I get it. But if you could be happy about something, if you, I'm not saying you should be, but if you could be happy about something, yeah, what might that be? So I do that with gratitude. Yeah. What are you grateful about? No, nothing. Okay. <laughs> but if you could be grateful about something, what would it be? It could be, you know, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that that I have a notepad where I can take notes right here because this is important information. Yeah. Anything. So yeah, to your point, it can be, it can be my name. Yeah, for sure. Now, where can people find you? Cause I'm sure this story is going to touch many people. If they want to find you, maybe ask you a question or talk to you, where can, where can they find you either on social media or any, any place that's available that they can have access to you? Yeah, the easiest place to find me is uh, my Instagram account, JD Luther 2.0. Um, and I'm I like, I, I've got this, I, you know, I haven't talked about this. It's been two and a half years uh, and I haven't talked much about it. I will tell you that I've talked to, I've talked to a couple of families that had kids that had sudden cardiac death. Yeah. To let them know. And, and for anybody that's listening, if this hits home with you, look, I was never, ever, ever, not at one point when this happened, never was I scared, never was I afraid. I didn't know I was dying. Yeah. If that's helpful to anybody, I, I am a I am a total open book. Contact me, message me. I will get back to you. I promise. And I'll get back to you quick. You can ask me anything you want about any of this. Um 
that's that is the easiest way to find me and talking to other people about it has been helpful for me but i'm just starting to post more about it i'm getting a lot of people that are contacting me asking me to post more about it um i kind of behind the scenes like i've done some talks for sads the sudden arrhythmic death, arrhythmic death syndrome yeah um and now i'm starting to kind of get a little more comfortable about it it's a yeah. hard place to be where you use something you had no control over right to to get an audience yeah so i i struggle with it but really it's more about like to your point you know you wrote the book it's more about using that to help other people so that's what i'm trying to get my head around now but yeah jd luther 2.0 on instagram this has been amazing. Oh my God. I'm so grateful that I just met you and I just feel such a great connection to you. I want to thank you for coming out and, you know, sharing your story with everybody because it does take a lot of courage, you know, talking about something that's so emotional and, and, and something that's played such a harsh impact in your life, you know, changed your life around, you know, for, you know, you had your, a lot of ups and downs, like a roller coaster ride, you know? Yeah. So when you talk about, in, you know, moments like that, from your life. It, it's not easy. People, you know, people don't realize that you could talk about it and you could look, you have the composure, but it, it um, there is a lot of emotion that's going on when you're talking about it. So I, I want to commend you for coming out and sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I tried to keep it together. I think I, <laughs> I was, I was uh, on the fence a couple of times there. Um, but look, more importantly, it's people like you that are giving me space to do it. Uh, so thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening. And thanks for building up an audience that I can tell my story to. That's the, that's the real gratitude. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for being on this show. You, you have a great it. day. Yeah, you too. Thanks.